Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, September 30th. I'm Kate Andrews, the Spectator's Economics Editor and your host this week. On this week's show, Labour had their annual conference in Brighton. Kiyostama was keen to prove that the days of Corbyn are long gone, but was overshadowed by infighting over party rules, the resignation of a shadow cabinet member, and a debate over whether only women have cervixes. Katie Balls will brief us on what happened, and Paul Embry and Aisha Hazarika will discuss whether Labour is headed in the right and electable direction. Most Brits, strangely enough, didn't spend their week obsessing over the Labour Party's rules for electing future leaders. A lack of lorry drivers has led to a fuel shortage, and people have been rushing to petrol stations to fill up their cars. It comes a few weeks after pictures of empty supermarket shelves were plastered on front pages. Are we wrong to rely on precarious, if efficient, delivery methods? And as a country, are we badly prepared for a crisis? I'll speak to Elizabeth Bra, a security expert who sits on the National Preparedness Committee. The government doesn't seem to have many answers to the fuel crisis. Tories head to Manchester at the weekend for party conference, so is this a chance for Boris to reset the agenda? I'll speak to James Forsyth, and Tory backbencher and former cabinet minister Anne Duncan-Smith will join us too. Germany went to the polls last week to pick Angela Merkel's successor. The results were inconclusive, and months of painstaking negotiations between different parties are now likely to follow. To tell us what happened and to explain why he thinks it leaves Ursula von der Leyen, president of the EU Commission, as the world's most powerful German politician, we'll speak to Matthew Lynn, who writes for the Spectator website this week. And finally, James Bond is out in cinemas this weekend. Daniel Craig's final outing as the spy comes in at 2 hours and 43 minutes. Are films and other things just too long? I'll speak to the writer Ascenda Maxtone Graham, who makes the case in this week's magazine. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the red subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And why not subscribe to The Spectator magazine too? You can get 10 weeks of the magazine delivered to your door, plus a bottle of Pims worth 25 pounds for just 10 pounds. To take up the deal, go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Hurry, it's only available while stocks last. And now to the show. First up, Labour Conference was a chance for Kiyostama to show people what kind of Prime Minister he wants to be. But most of the headlines were about a shadow cabinet resignation and fighting over rule changes. Was it all bad though? I'm joined now by The Spectator's Deputy Political Editor, Katie Balls. Katie, thanks for joining me. You were at Labour Party Conference this week. Now the big news for most people across the country was the fuel crisis. With all the attention on that, one might think that Labour would take the opportunity to really get at the Tories. Yes, it didn't quite happen like that. No. Um, it was interesting covering Labour conference. Now, clearly, uh, both Keir Starmer and his team have spent weeks, perhaps even months in advance, planning the substance of their speeches, working out what they want their main themes to be. But the fact this was also happening at a time when most people in the country were waking up and not sure if they could get to work, how the fuel crisis was going to affect them, meant lots of the um, you know people present at the conference, both Labour MPs and even international visitors, were slightly bemused it didn't play a more central role. It was mentioned in the leader's speech, but that's the very end of conference. And I think that, for example, I had one diplomat say to me, not you know, particularly loaded, they just simply asked, you know, why didn't Keir Starmer begin conference uh, filling up cars for petrol, trying to, um, at Brighton at a petrol station? Um, it would have got him lots of press. Now, I think that you could clearly say something like that would be a stunt, but it would get you a certain level of exposure and I think show that Labour was part of a conversation, which, uh, you know, is the con is the conversation the country is currently in. And instead, it just very much felt like the Labour Party spent most of conference talking to itself. Now, I think that in some ways, I think that's needed to get the party into the right place to then talk to the country. But it therefore served as a reminder of how much work Labour has to do to get to the point where it is election fit. So if Labour wasn't focusing on the fuel crisis for most of conference, what were they focused on? There are a range of things. I think if you look at the initial headlines from Labour conference, it wasn't particularly what uh, Team Starmer would have uh, desired. Uh, we had a row on the first day after Angela Rayner, the deputy leader, 
uh, used a, a speech or a, a reception, so this was later in the evening, we can say, um, to talk about Tory scum. Um, so then there was a row, Keir Starmer's big Andrew Marr interview, which is supposed to be the scene setter, had to spend a fair bit of time with uh, Andrew Marr asking Keir Starmer if it's appropriate to call Tories scum. He didn't, but he didn't uh, you know, say that he'd asked Angela Rayner to apologise. Um, and then we also had uh, various trans issues coming up. Um, I think in that same interview, you had Keir Starmer say that it was wrong to say only women have a cervix, and therefore cervix was trending on Twitter. Quite a lot, actually, of the whole conference period, lots of events bringing that back to the fore. And then I think uh, we can say the thrust in the sense of uh, what was in Starmer's control, and he chose to do anyway, were the rule changes. Um, so you had days of, you know, battles, internal faction or warfare over rule changes, um, particularly on uh, how uh, many people need to support a Labour leader uh, for, for Keir Starmer's successor, taking power away from the membership. And Keir Starmer did win to a degree on this. He didn't get everything he wanted through, but he got a version of it. Um, but and therefore his team are very optimistic about that. They think it's going to mean that they can be more bullish in the future because Labour MPs are harder to deselect. It's harder to challenge Keir Starmer from the left. But the flip side of that is we, uh, we all got to see Labour's dirty laundry played out um, and the fact that there is still plenty of division. So in your piece for the magazine this week, you talk about the infighting that defined Labour Party conference. But in terms of those fights, who came out on top? Is Keir Starmer stronger or weaker coming out of conference? I think Starmer is stronger. I think the issue is stronger and stronger two different things. Right. And we have a situation where it's fairly low expectations. Keir Starmer did manage to get the upper hand on the left of his party. I think by the end of it, even those heckles during Keir Starmer's speech, uh, you know, very varied the heckling. We had, you know, where's Peter Mandelson? Uh, I think someone at one point shouted about Julian Assange, um, but also big focus on the minimum wage, the fact that um, one of the dramas of Labour conference was uh, that uh, Keir Starmer had a member whose shadow cabinet quit because he won't uh, agree to the idea of raising the minimum wage to £15. So there's a lot of that. Um, but I think the fact that Keir Starmer got through that speech and wasn't put off um, showed that he was standing up to that side of his party and in a way played to his benefit. Um, but again, we do go back to the point that he has managed to show that he is in control of various parts of his party, but there's still that side who are out against him, and we're not yet sure what he plans to do with that. So Labour actually struggled to make a lot of the front pages throughout their conference, and now we're going into Tory party conference from this Sunday. How are Labour going to continue to make themselves relevant over the next few weeks uh, and make those headlines? How do they go about attacking the government during their conference? Well, going back to the fuel crisis, you'd think there's plenty of things Labour could do in, in the coming days and weeks. Um, I think it is inevitably the case that when it is a party's conference, they tend to dominate the news. You, for example, uh, in the past week, haven't seen many ministers going onto the airwaves because there's a bit of a code of conduct there where you let the other take um, centre stage. So I think Tory conference is clearly being dominated by the Tories. And Keir Starmer's best hope is that the Tories mess up in some way. They say the wrong thing or you know the crisis around them gets worse and that will dominate it. But longer term, I think Keir Starmer needs to work out how he can get in on the national conversation. And that's something which um, he didn't prove at this conference. Yes, he made some progress, but he didn't appear reactive, um, able to respond to changing events in the way that I think many in his party would like him to be. Katie, thanks for joining me. And I'm now joined by the journalist and former Labour advisor Aisha Hazarika and the columnist and trade unionist Paul Embry. Hi to both of you. Thanks for joining Spectator TV. Aisha, you wrote in your column for the Evening Standard that Stama had a good week. What do you mean by that? So I think it didn't start off as a good week, but I think it that that pain was necessary to get to the end point, which was quite a good week. The most important thing that he did is that a year ago, he said that the party's under new management. This year, he proved it. And that's because he has taken on the hard left in the party through those rule changes the most important rule changes are that MPs now don't have to look over their shoulder about being deselected by a noisy group of, of Marxists in their local Labour constituency parties. And the other important rule change was that he's hopefully meant that another Jeremy Corbyn or hard left candidate will not ever be leader of the Labour Party again. 
So they're really important things. And I think his big message from the conference speech, yes, there was lots of this is who I am and there was some sort of policy stuff. But I think it was him sending a message to the country saying, I am not Jeremy Corbyn. We're not having that kind of politics anymore. And I'm moving the Labour Party to the mainstream. I think the heckles were incredibly helpful for him. In fact, so good they could have even been planted. It allowed him to use that pre-scripted line saying, oh, on a, you know, at noon on a Wednesday, I'm normally getting heckled by Tories and to say, look, you know, you can chant empty slogans or you can change lives. So it allowed him to kind of deliver those things. So I think that's the big message that's got out. However, there's still such a long way to go, by no means is Labour connecting with the public yet. But I think after this conference, he's at least got the party on the pitch. Paul, do you agree that Stama had a good week? And is that the same thing as the Labour Party having a good week? I thought he had a reasonable week. Um, he ended up kind of getting a score draw out of the proposals for how we elect the leader in the future. Um, he kind of snatched that score draw really from the, the, the jaws of defeat in some respects. Um, I thought his speech was okay. Uh, I thought in delivery it was a bit stilted, a bit wooden. I thought the content was fairly good. I wouldn't really pitch it higher than that. Um, he talked about the, the, the two rocks of his life being family and work. Um, I think that was a, a good line. Um, I, too rarely, frankly, in recent years, as, as the Labour Party talks about the issues that really matter to ordinary working people uh, and issues like family and work is central to that. He also in his speech touched on stuff like patriotism, the importance of the armed forces, respect for the armed forces, the importance of law and order and tackling crime. Um, so in that respect, he was clearly pitching towards some of those voters uh, who, who Labour have lost over recent years. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is, whatever, whatever Keir Starmer thinks about the direction of the Labour Party, that the, the Labour Party needs to go in, and I do think he does or he's developing a clear idea around that. The reality is large parts of the party simply don't want to go there. And when I say large parts, I'm not just talking about the kind of radical Corbynite left, the hard left, who, who clearly don't like any of that kind of faith, family and flag stuff. Um, but frankly, the liberal left as well, um, you know, the more centrist, the Blairite left, who don't really do that stuff instinctively, but probably had the nous to realise that Labour has got to speak that language in order to win over working class voters and, and the mainstream. Um, so, so yes, Starmer, I think, is developing a clear eyed idea of where the party needs to go. But whether or not the party is going to go with him um, remains to be seen. For me, there's still a mountain to climb. And I think the party is still very much in the foothills. Aisha, what do you make of that? I mean, the Corbynistas aren't going to disappear overnight, nor does the Labour Party necessarily want them to completely disappear. Surely they'll want them on, on polling day to, to show up and, and vote Labour. Is Stama trying to straddle too many horses at one time? No, I, I don't think he is. I think the really noisy, disruptive, difficult, sort of malign elements of, of, the, of the sort of Corbyn project... I think they are actually quite sort of small in number. And I think that Starmer and his team have been quite hard in, in cracking down on them. So, for example, one of the things that I really noticed was that this year at conference, just the atmosphere was much better. I know there was a little bit of heckling in the hall, but in previous years under Jeremy Corbyn, it has been a very, very uncomfortable, quite aggressive, intimidating atmosphere at Labour Party conference. I know certainly people have come up to me and lots of finger pointing and really being super aggressive. Somebody spat at me once. So there was there was none of that this time. Yes, it was not all, you know, hunky dory on the floor. So I think that the team have already been very, very clear in saying to those people, we don't want you anywhere near the party. So I don't think they feel that they do need those um, Corbyn people. What I think they do need, though, and, and, and this is something that Paul has just sort of touched on, you know, a lot of people in the Labour Party are progressive. That's one of the reasons they're in the Labour Party. So, of course, you know, he, he's done this first job of saying, look, we've done some kind of hygiene on the party. We've got the, the party in order. But he is going to have these tensions when it comes to policy going forward. Some of that will be ideological in terms of 
liberal values, you know, butting up against other things. A lot of those are going to be fiscal as well. We saw this big row with Andy McDonald over a £15 uh, minimum wage, which, look, many people w would love, but what Rachel Reeves, who had a very good conference, she had a really excellent conference, she's setting out, you know, some very, very kind of tough fiscal new rules for the party. She's saying, no, I'm not having it that shadow ministers go out and freelance in terms of making up policy, which is basically what was happening under Jeremy Corbyn. So I don't think they're going to shed any tears about more bust-ups with kind of Corbynites or more bust-ups in terms of value for money and fiscal responsibility. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. There are going to be tensions down the track in terms of where that biting point is in terms of balancing, you know, progressive Labour values with, with where the, the, the country um, might be and what might be popular. Paul, you've been critical of the Labour Party in the past for focusing too much on identity politics. There was no shortage of culture wars at Labour's conference this week. What did you make of it? Well, there hasn't been a shortage of culture wars in the Labour Party or on the broader left for, for many years now. So, so it's to be expected in many ways. And unfortunately, I think because of having immersed itself in uh, in identity politics um the, the the party has if you like widened that chasm between it and ordinary working class voters and you know you saw some of this stuff during um during the conference i mean i switched on one morning i heard uh, a delegate calling for rosie duffield to, to to have the whip withdrawn because she was transphobic i heard another delegate complaining that they're you know, were, were, were women only spaces in terms of the, the toilets in the conference hall. And you just kind of think, look, if ordinary people are switching onto this, which probably most of them aren't, but if they were, what would they make of this stuff? The Labour Party, in many respects, has positioned itself on the fringe on some of these issues and has shown that its priorities, or certainly the priorities of large parts of the party over recent years, are simply not the priorities of, of ordinary people across this country. And I think the key question for Labour is this, look, how do they win back the Red Wall? How do they win back those vast chunks of the country which were Labour since time immemorial until 2019, but abandoned Labour in their millions? Provincial Britain, small town Britain, blue collar Britain, these people who, as I say, would have been tribally Labour once upon a time, but felt so abandoned by the party and felt that the, the, the Labour Party sneered at them and mocked them and, and simply didn't want their votes anymore. And Labour needs to try to, to retrieve that historic coalition, um, that, that coalition between what I've called Hampstead and Hartlepool, you know, the more liberal, the more metropolitan white collar voters on the one hand, but also provincial Britain, working class Britain, blue collar Britain, voters with, you know, soft conservative uh, values and views on, on social and cultural issues. Um, and that coalition has fragmented uh, and the working class element of it has simply been elbowed aside and having felt not wanted they've gone off and voted for, for somebody else so so the key task for Labour and I think this is something that as, a, as I said before neither the liberal left or the, the radical left within the party get is you have to start speaking the language and reflecting the priorities of those people you have to make a pitch to the Gillian Duffy's of this world, the people who voted Labour once upon a time, but were treated in the end as some sort of embarrassing elderly relative by the party. And if anyone thinks that, you know, just by talking about the armed forces or, or law and order or patriotism, those voters are going to come flocking back. They're going to have a rude awakening because it has to be rooted, I think, in an ideological change, an internal revolution within the party. It has to be rooted in hard policy. And you have to show through that policy development and through language that you do understand those voters, that you are prepared to win them back, you want to win their hearts and minds. And the, you know, the reality is, unless you do that, you're never going to win power again. Aisha, last word to you. By the next election, what does your gut tell you? Will Labour have uh, continued to stay in its comforted little bubble? Or will it have branched out in the ways that Paul talks about? Well, I mean, again, we haven't talked about Scotland and all of this. And, you know, it, it does actually show you that, you know, uh, there is a place north of the, the Red Wall. There is this place called Scotland, which is really, really important because it's still part of the United Kingdom for the time being. And Labour is not going to get to Downing Street until it shifts more votes in Scotland. And currently there are more liberal MPs. 
Liberal Democrat MPs and pandas than there are uh, Labour MPs in Scotland. And Labour used to be absolutely dominant in Scotland, particularly in the west of Scotland, where, where I grew up, where, you know, the pillars of society were football, Rangers and Celtic, the church and the Labour Party and the trade union movement. So I let the Red Wall is very, very important, but it is not the only thing that Labour has to think about and just think about the values that people have in Scotland as well, because there is a lot of, it's very fashionable to be like, oh, the Labour Party just, you never think about the North, which there is, I have a lot of sympathy for, but it literally doesn't think about Scotland either. And Keir Starmer has got to shift the needle in Scotland. Otherwise, it's it's just not going to happen. In terms of where I think Labour will be as we run up to the next general election, I do think this week is very important in terms of this was the turning point where the Labour Party stopped just being a, a complete joke and a rabble and it began to be a, a serious contender with its eyes on power instead of just virtuous opposition. Um, but there is a long, long way to go. Keir Starmer has to get a bigger swing than Tony Blair did in 1997 to, just to get a sort of majority of, of one. So it is going to be really difficult. But I think he is very serious about this. Really interesting looking at the coverage today. Actually, quite a lot of the right wing papers are saying that, you know, he, he did a he did a good job. And I think that's 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 a big moment, you know, to, to sort of be looked at as a credible, you know, prime minister in in waiting. I thought the picture in the front of the Telegraph today was was, you, you know, money couldn't buy that picture. Keir Starmer with his wife looking like a sort of normal um, person. Sometimes those kind of, you know, the partners coming up at the end of conference could be really, really cringe for, for sort of a Labour leader who looked really sort of awkward about the whole thing. He does have a confidence about him. Listening to him today on the radio as well, just talking about his time as director of public prosecution, he is a serious man. And we are entering very, very serious times. You know, people not being able to fill their cars up, real worry about fuel bills on the horizon, food shortages, like a lot of chaos on on the horizon. So while he has got a long way to go, and I would never underestimate the campaigning juggernaut that is Boris Johnson, you know, if things continue to be very, very tricky and competence and planning does get cut through with the public then I think Keir Starmer um, could be much more of a contender than people have ever thought him capable of. Aisha and Paula, thanks for joining Spectator TV. Britain is in the middle of a fuel crisis with people having to queue for hours to fill up their cars. Like the food shortages reported a few weeks ago, it stems from a lack of lorry drivers. Why weren't we prepared for this? And after a year and a half of restrictions, have we learned our lessons? Are we prepared for another crisis? I'm joined now by the security expert Elizabeth Bra, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute who sits on the UK's National Preparedness Committee. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Britain is suffering from a fuel shortage. It's estimated that we are now 100,000 HGV drivers short. To what extent is this an international problem and to what extent is the government to blame? Well, it's, it's both. Uh, it's an international problem or rather a Western problem because for so many years we've been telling uh, teenagers that uh, the best thing to do in life is to go to university and, and then we also look down on people in manual professions. So if you're a teenager, why would you ever go into a manual profession? And now we are reaping the, the fruit of, of uh, that mentality and those policies. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a pan-Western problem, but the UK has been uh, one of the most active countries in, in telling uh, young people to go to university it was uh, the Blair government but also conservative governments and lo and behold it turns out that that when you look down on people in manual professions when you tell uh, young people to go into academic professions then you don't have the sort of people who make your daily life work mm. well they're now offering salaries to some HGV drivers of 1,500 pounds per week it could well be the case that driving a lorry is going to be a far more lucrative career for the coming months and years than it would be if you went to university and got a so-called white-collar job. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. In fact, it's a recent phenomenon because we have this shortage. Prices are 
going up. Um, I suppose it's quite difficult to retrospectively prepare for that, right? It's impossible. Um, we may be attracting people into the profession now, but there were very good reasons, even a few years ago, that people might not want to have trained up as lorry drivers. I mean, it was becoming an increasingly difficult career. That's right, and, and that's why I think uh, you have to, uh, you as, as a society, have to respect the people who are in, in those jobs more and, and, uh, and companies have to pay them more. Because if, if there are no benefits, or very few benefits to being in a particular profession, why would anybody pursue it? Uh, and, but I think what has become clear uh, now uh, in these past few weeks and, and also during the COVID pandemic is that the, the many of the professions that we, we think of as less worthy are actually the ones who make uh, that, that make society uh, uh, tick, make make it operate efficiently. Um, uh, from from nursing assistants to to uh, nursing home assistants to lorry drivers to to um, Tesco workers, all these people are fundamentally important to to making our society work. And and I, one could even argue that people like you and me sitting in an office are more dispensable than they are. Well, indeed, I'm sure, at least for me. Um, to what extent is this uh, the, the public's fault, consumers' fault for rushing out to the petrol station to potentially overbuy, to stockpile, when there isn't actually a petrol shortage internationally? Yeah, so, so this is the, 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 com, uh, the converse wisdom of crowds when, when, when crowds go collectively a little bit crazy. But nobody, no single driver at a petrol station in the UK at the moment would say, well, I'm, I'm panic buying now because you never know what will happen. Everybody will say, oh, I'm, I'm being prudent. I'm, I'm filling up so that I, I don't get stranded if, if things were to, to get worse. And, and that is the, the challenge when, uh, when the public is not prepared for contingencies. And I think that's why uh, some of the Scandinavian countries have lessons that, that the rest of us can learn from. Uh, they try to to prepare the public for crises and to make sure they don't overreact when, when there is a situation like this. And as you say, there is no uh, immediate shortage of, of petrol at the moment, but at the moment everybody uh, keeps filling up and filling up various uh, reserve canisters and so forth. That's when the, the real shortage uh, will, will occur, which is what's happening now. You're an expert in nations building up resilience and there have been a lot of questions recently about the extent to which the UK was ready not simply for COVID but for any kind of crisis that might hit and it just seems to be one crisis after another. Is part of the issue that enough slack isn't being built into the system? To do so is expensive to essentially say we're going to have more resources and more capacity than we think we might actually use. But the flip side of that is what we're seeing right now. And it isn't just petrol, it's the gas shortage in the UK, it's NHS beds. We could even potentially be facing more restrictions or indeed another lockdown this winter if the NHS hits capacity. So is that problem the, the lack of slack in the system? Um, I think the problem is, um, well, first of all, it's the lack of, of slack, as you say, or the, the lack of, of redundancy capabilities. So the, the model for, so, for, for a number of years now has been just in time, with deliveries uh, taking place constantly around the clock, which makes us extremely dependent on, on global supply chains and what happens if, if they get disrupted. Um, and then there is the uh, the other model, which is just in case, which is I think is the model we need to to uh, use more. And it's it's more expensive because country uh, companies then have to have uh, extra supplies, extra stock um, of of the the products that that they sell. But uh, the the problem I think is also with with how shareholders and boards reward uh, CEOs and and other executives for the performance. You, you're not at the moment. You're not rewarded as a CEO for doing just in case you're rewarded for doing just in time because it's cheaper but we as a society then get into big 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 trouble when, when those supplies uh, are disrupted in some way and so I think uh, as a result of COVID when we saw uh, shortages and as a result of the truck driver crisis uh, lorry driver crisis and also as a result I think of, of shipping delays that will cause uh, other shortages I think we have to move more towards this just in case model and reward Reward CEOs to think prud who think prudently, and I think even uh, it would be even be a good idea for companies to, in their annual report, uh, document how they are pre preparing for just in uh, just in case to show that they are prudent and they won't be caught in a situation where they can't provide the service that their customers expect of them. Do you think the market will correct for this? Do you think 
customers are now going to demand that when they're investing with a company, when they're trusting a company to deliver any range of product from energy to food or whatever else, that they're going to want to know that um, it will continue to be delivered in the difficult times. I think so. And uh, one and a half years ago, two years ago, I wouldn't have said so. I mean, I've been talking about just in, in case now for a long time. And, and for a long time, it was difficult to make the case for it because everything seemed to work so smoothly. But then came COVID and, and the realization that, oh, there are disruptions uh, that, are, uh, that can take place that are really serious. So I think that was a collective wake up call that's continuing now with, the, with these new disruptions as well. And so I think there's, uh, there is um, uh, even a competitive advantage to be had by, by companies that prepare adequately and, and they can show the, the stock market and, and their boards that they are better prepared than other companies and I think they'll be rewarded for it. A lot of people are saying that the government should step in, that the government should oversee what you're describing as, as a just-in-case strategy, but um, my caution about that or my skepticism is that when you look at areas that the government has been responsible for, especially over the past 18 months, we've seen a serious lack of preparation there. I mean, to what extent was the government prepared for COVID? Uh, to what extent were private companies prepared for what hit us? And do you think either group, the government or the private sector, have made much effort to change their policies to prepare for the next time that something very severe happens? Well, the government had tried to prepare, and uh, had, had tried to prepare, and for example, conducted this uh, major pandemic exercise. But then, very oddly, put put the findings uh, somewhere on the shelf and didn't implement them, uh, which was a big mistake. But I think what needs to happen is it's not just the government that needs to exercise for these really serious contingencies. It's the government and the private sector collectively, because uh, the government uh, is only one part of of uh, the operation of our society. And if, if uh, private companies are disrupted, if they can't deliver the services that we as, as a public and the government uh, rely on, then uh, no government exercise will, will solve that problem or, or will, will make um, uh, the, the crisis uh, go away when, when it occurs. So I think what needs to happen is uh, government and, and the private sector need to exercise together for contingencies from pandemics to to shipping delays, to uh, cyber attacks, and then they are prepared collectively if something were to happen. And then the other thing is uh, the public needs to be prepared. So, for example, the Swedish government put out a, a leaflet a couple of years ago called If Crisis or War Comes, that tells people what to do in a crisis so that they don't do what UK drivers have been doing, uh, which is uh, fill up a little bit more than they need to, uh, just in case. Uh, so if we do all those things, I, I think, um, will be better prepared for, for the next crises and there will be many of them and they, will, they are inevitable because we are so dependent on global supply chains that are quite complex and very long and that will have uh, uh, disruptions uh, whether we like it or not it's just the reality of, of these uh, very complex uh, delivery systems. Elizabeth, last question. I wanted to pick you up on something you just mentioned about Sweden. I know you've written a lot about preparing a population through information campaigns, uh, getting private companies to diversify and, and essentially putting leaflets through doors, I think, in, in many circumstances to give people the information they need. Which countries are doing this well and what exactly does that information campaign look like? Yeah, so the Swedish model, I think, is, is uh, fantastic. And it's, uh, by the way, a model that builds on what Sweden used to do during the Cold War, but it also builds on, on what earthquake zones do. So I used to live in San Francisco, and there were constant public awareness campaigns about how to prepare for earthquakes. Japan does the same. Uh, cities in New Zealand uh, do the same. And uh, so the, the leaflet was called uh, If Crisis of War Comes, and uh, it describes in very simple uh, terms, as bullet points, uh, this is what a crisis looks like. Uh, this is how to prepare. This is what sort of uh, items to have at home. This is how you know that uh, that the crisis is uh, is approaching or is taking place. And this is what to do while it's happening. And this is how you know that, that it's over. Uh, so very, um, very uh, easy language. And, and as you said, it was delivered to every household in the country, because if you put it online, then people will have to get online and consult the leaflet when the crisis is, is taking place, which may not be possible. 
So that's one model. Then another model that is, uh, is uh, uh, even newer is what the Czech Republic is doing. And it's doing um, a really innovative thing, which is uh, exercising uh, or exercises involving the armed forces and the private sector in non-military non scenarios. So it's scenarios precisely like this, and they've selected key companies in the Czech Republic and, and uh, they exercise, these companies have exercised together with the armed forces to be better prepared for crises like, like the one we are seeing at the moment. I think that sort of concept or that model will spread as well. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Now, we haven't heard much in the way of solutions from the government on the fuel crisis, but with Tory conference starting on Sunday, is that about to change? The Conservatives go into their annual meeting with a very comfortable majority, but after a difficult month following on from the unveiling of the national insurance tax hike to pay for health and social care. To discuss how it will go, I'm joined by our political editor James Forsyth and Tory MP Ian Duncan-Smith. James, Ian, thanks for joining me. James first. Tory party conference starts on Sunday, but we're in the middle of both a gas price and fuel crisis. Is this a chance to reset the agenda? I think if you'd said this will be the first uh, Tory conference after the party wins an 80 seat majority, you would have thought that it would be a kind of champagne fueled kind of victory bash. But obviously, uh, a lot has happened uh, since the Tories won that, that victory in December 2019. And I think there's obviously not only the kind of short term concerns prompted by the petrol crisis and uh, these rising gas prices and what they mean for the winter ahead. But I also think there is, a, there, is a, there is a kind of bigger nagging philosophical question bugging a lot of Tories right now, which is kind of, you know, what is the purpose of this government? Th this government was essentially elected in 2019 to kind of get Brexit done and keep Jeremy Corbyn out. And it, it has done both of those things now. Uh, you then obviously had the pandemic, which took up, you know, nearly all of the government's bandwidth and time. And so now the question is, you know, what is the government's post-pandemic agenda? And I think that is what they are going to need to flesh out uh, in Manchester next week. And no doubt the party will be looking backward to the victories that it had even before the COVID crisis hit. But still, these, these are not ideal circumstances to be heading into the Tories party conference. Well, we have to say, first of all, that uh, COVID is like a war. Uh, in the sense that it's knocked the agenda of the government such as it existed back in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. It's knocked it, it's punched a hole through it, really. Um, so recovering out of COVID a year and a half into a government uh, means that we're almost starting from scratch, in a sense. So this conference is the first public conference, but it's also almost really the first conference because everything else has been COVID. So the questions that we pose is what kind of government are we going to be as a Conservative government? And I think the range of options lies clearly between a sort of Ted Heathian government or a Margaret Thatcher style government where, you know, it's a case of low taxes and lower spending and greater booming economy, um, the private sector taking over. So the question really is where do we lie on the spectrum of that and where do those phrases uh, build back better and levelling up? What do they actually mean when you get to test them in the arena of political decision. So those are the big questions that will be posed. Uh, there are a lot of funny and strange answers that are already coming out. In the midst of that, <clears throat> it's worth reminding ourselves of Macmillan's What Do I Fear Most? Events, dear boys, events. And the truth is we are facing also within all of that a set of events post-COVID, a lot of them coming out of COVID, which will uh, almost like earthquakes, uh, have seismic shocks that go through the system. You know, one is the whole failure on uh, haulage drivers because they shut down uh, every single testing centre uh, stupidly during the course of Covid. That's exacerbated an already existing problem, the, uh, the, the mendacity and peculiar selfishness of many of the haulier companies who have invested next to nothing in their drivers for so long, uh, being torn away by cheap labour from Eastern Europe. All of these were meant to be Brexit questions that were settled, but where we find actually Brexit is still looming in the mirror because these are still there and they're causing us problems. So competence is critical. How do we display that? We have to be free of this petrol pump problem by the time we get to the conference. And then it's about policy and direction and sending us off believing that we have a purpose. James, let's talk about the definitions of these slogans because when you scroll through the fringe guide for Tory party conference, leveling up is undoubtedly one of the most popular topics. 
Do you think we're going to learn over the next few days what the slogan actually means? I think the question of what is, what does levelling up mean? Now, I think everyone knows what it means in terms of the long term. I think the challenge of the government I is... I honestly don't. Genuinely. Okay, I think it... <laughs> does it mean tax rises, which we've had? Does it mean um, tax breaks for, you know, people who are on lower incomes? Uh, what? I have no idea, to be honest, what the I, I think, long-term so I think agenda in, in of the Tory party is. Long term, the aim is that every part of a country should be as prosperous as London and the South East. That is obviously the kind of utopian kind of Boris Johnson view of what levelling up means. I think that obviously the more complicated question is how do you get there and what are the stops along the way? Now, Boris Johnson is very, he wants a very broad definition of levelling up. He thinks the fact that it encompasses lots of things is part of its appeal. I actually think you need a much tighter definition of levelling up around boosting economic growth in the regions and devolving power down. If you, I think one of the things that you see is this is still a very centralised country. And I think if you look at those bits of, uh, those bits of, of England, which are uh, making, you know, doing well in terms of inward investment and the like, they are often places that have a mayor, someone who can act to corral investment there, bring people together, make sure things work. And I think that those, I think those are, should be the two big levers that the government tries to pull on levelling up. You know, which is one of which is giving away power and down to down to a local level. And I think this is, I think that the problem of levelling up is at the moment is is it is that it is in danger of becoming like Build Back Better. It's just in danger of becoming a slogan that the government attaches to everything it does, rather than a policy agenda. James, what do you think the prime minister wants to get out of his party conference? I think if you, I mean, we've interviewed Dominic Raab for the magazine this week, uh, and you know he mentioned delivery probably more times in that interview than any other single word. You look at the kind of clip, every clip Boris Johnson does right now, it's about delivery. I think he wants to give this sense that the government is, you know, is, is getting back on with stuff post COVID, and it and is doing what it said it would do. I think that is the, I think that's what Boris Johnson thinks is the most important message for him to get out of that conference. Uh, I think that the challenge for him is uh, uh, on, you know, they often talk about social care, for example, and the health and social care levy is an example of delivery. It's not yet delivery. It's a decision to raise taxes, to put more money into the NHS and to, in time, find more money for social care. It's not actually delivering that new system. And I think, you know, I think in one of the things that Ian, Ian said that COVID was like a war, I think one of the other things we forget is just how much of this parliament COVID has already taken up. This government is operating on, on a very compressed timetable if it wants to make visible changes to people's lives by the next election. And Ian, this brings us back to a, a point that you raised at the start of this discussion, which is that the Tories have this big question hovering over them. What kind of party do they want to be? Do they want to be more interventionist, more big state? Do they want to go down eventually a lower tax route? What would you like to see from the Tory party and what are you hoping to hear at conference? Well, actually, now on the positive side, what, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the problems, but the truth is there are some big positives for this government if they have the energy and the courage to seize them. We left the European Union. One of the key reasons why, if not almost the most important reason why, is we, when we say take back control, it's about what do we believe in regulation? What's the level of regulation that should be set, the interference in people's lives? I was asked by the Prime Minister to do a report, it's called the Tigger Report, and it's about what can we do to deregulate and change. And we came forward with a significant number, over 100 recommendations, but more importantly to shift the concept of regulation, not to a, an absolutely over-intrusive process that says, you know, if anything could go wrong, we have to measure that before it happens, and actually allow, as they do in common law, iterative change. Now, that means basically the real underpinning of this economy is about how you make the UK economy light on its feet, very inventive, all the innovation areas from medical tech through to uh, uh, fight financial technology, all of these things are all there for us to grab, but we have to be bold. And this government in the next year, and this is pretty much all it's got, has got to shift mountains in terms of regulation. It's got to make sure that we are a very attractive place, the most attractive place 
in Europe to invest money in because we're the place where you can build these things. We can compete with California because we know where we're going. There's no reason why you should be governed by companies in California. You need to change the rules around GDPR, allow people to take greater control. There is a whole report, and it's good that David Frost is now going to drive that through government. But it requires government ministers not to be bound down by civil servants and to make those changes. If we do that, this will open up the British economy after COVID and it will make us a really powerful force for innovation. All these technologies are in existence here at a time when we have real issues over how we trade with China and various others. The UK could be a real hub for all of this. I would drive that now. That is what I believe uh, levelling up is all about because it will bring business to areas around the UK other than London that can actually develop these technologies and be at the heart of it. That gives business entrepreneurship and real rises in salaries. Away from all those cheap salaries that we thought we could pay previously and now into serious value-added work that we could do. This is the UK that voted to leave the European Union. If we don't do that, there was no purpose in us leaving at all. But Ian, Leveling up is this government going to deregulate? It has to be. It has to be. It's not just... It's, I'm not Are talking about casual they will? I, Well, David Frost has now been tasked with that, and that's the one brilliant thing that has happened. I know that he's really focused on this. And lots of people don't understand what we mean by deregulation. It's not slash and burn. It's about resetting the whole nature of how we look at regulation in the, in the way in which we deal, for example, with common law. It's about, you know, if we don't know whether it's dangerous, we don't legislate for it. We let ourselves discover those things and only intervene when it's necessary. This is the whole key to it. And with that, you know, there is huge areas in medical technology, which the UK is already ripped to lead. We could be blowing that right out the water. <clears throat> the same with uh, FinTech and everything else. They're right on the cusp. The UK could be that nation that literally competes with the best in the world. But it requires us to take advantage of leaving the European Union. This is the test. Are we serious? Are we brave? Are we bold and will we do it? Because if we meander around in the next year and a half trying to figure out what we're going to do in the short term, it's not going to work. Leveling up and building back better are about getting the UK <clears throat> the most flexible nation in Europe and also competing on that global stage. And that requires us to shift the burden of regulation and innovation so that we bring businesses here to the UK. And what's the mood of the Tory MPs going into party conference? Well, it's, it's difficult. You know, they're still upbeat. You know, we won a big majority. Labour, as we see in this Labour conference, is still at each other. Yes, there's been some improvement in a way uh, in some of their rules. But the truth is, Labour still doesn't quite know where it's going. It's still made a series of hostages to fortune. So the Tories coming into the conference will still feel upbeat. They still feel that, you know, in Boris, they've got probably the, the world's best political salesman. And you do need a good salesman at the helm, but we also need good strategy as well, and that's important. But, you know, I think they're still upbeat, but they're, they're beginning to get concerned that we need to see some pace on all of this. And we, you know, we're not the party that spends its time rising tax, raising taxes. We've got to be in the business of getting the economy right. And many of them have said to me, what we need to do is treat the debt like war debt from COVID and get on to really engineer this economy, get lower taxes, get lower regulation and really make this economy zing. If we do that, we'll be able to pay back the debt at a more accelerated pace. But first, let's get the economy moving and not do things like raising national insurance and for things that will never happen. I mean, honestly, if anyone believes the health service in three years' time is going to give back any money to social services, then I have to say they haven't been in politics very long. James, uh, we are getting tax rises. The economy, um, well, we don't know if it's stagnated, but the figures from August were uh, extremely disappointing. Um, are, what, what sense are you picking up from Tory MPs? Is there this optimism that, that Ian points to, or are some of them slightly more depressed? I think there is a desire for a greater sense of what the Tory party is for, what the government is for, that point about you know post-Brexit, post-Covid, what is the government trying to do? I actually think if I was a Tory MP, the thing that would have alarmed me most this week was Andrew Bailey's speech on Monday evening, saying that the recovery is already weakening, uh, warning about the dangers of having to put up interest rates because of inflation, but with the economy not being strong enough or robust enough to take that. And his warning that these supply and labour shortages are, are, are going to get worse, not better. 
uh, and his warning that this autumn is going to be hard yards. I mean, I think this is, I think it is that economic backdrop that, that, is, that, is, that is the biggest risk to the Tories. And I think, as Ian was saying in one of his earlier answers, you know, the government, th this autumn is going to be difficult, uh, uh, in part because of some delayed shocks from COVID, some Brexit adjustments. And I think the government has to cr give a sense that it is, that it is in charge, but it, it knows what it is doing, that it has not been buffeted by events. James, last question to you. What should SPEC TV watchers be looking out for at Tory, at Tory party conference? Any tensions, any major moments that you would be looking for? I, I think the interesting question is, is I think there is a, a, a bubbling away under the surface and it might come to the surface given that this is the first in-person conference in, in, in such a long time, is the question of, you know, what, what is the point of the Tory party? Um, has it become... Uh, one um, one senior Tory said to me recently, "We were elected as Thatcherites. We govern as Gaullists. You know, has the Tory party now essentially become a Gaullist party, or you know, is it going to go back uh, more to that that, that kind of the, the, the kind of Thatcherite settlement?" Uh, so I think watch that question, and then I think also watch to see in this debate about the post Brexit adjustment. I mean, you see this uh, very interestingly. You know, Dominic Raab in this interview uh, for the Spectator this week is very explicit. You know, but basically, if you were to uh, issue you know a hundred thousand visas to, to lorry drivers, as, as Keir Starmer is suggesting, you know, he says you know that, that wouldn't solve this country's you know um, being hooked on cheap labour. It, it would just be a sticking plaster solution. And that the only solution he argues is to kind of raise wages in, in, in all of these jobs where, where firms struggle to find uh, enough British workers to fill the gaps. I think that the tension between that thinking and the desire to make sure that Christmas is uninterrupted, I think that, that is going to be something that bubbles along uh, at this conference. And also the whole, related to that, the whole question of a Tory party's relationship with business, I think is going to become an increasingly interesting question. Uh, to what extent, you know, it, it, should the Tory party be doing what kind of business wants in terms of immigration and the like, or to what extent should the government be saying to business, no, 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 you're going to have to pay people more, invest more in training. I think those three tensions are the things that I'll be looking out for. Not, not, I don't think you'll see that much of it on the conference uh, platform, but I think on the conference fringe, those and in the bars, those will be the big questions being debated. James and Anne, thanks for coming on. Germans went to the polls last week to pick who they want to be Angela Merkel's successor. The result was pretty inconclusive, and there are now likely to be months of negotiations to decide who will take charge. Spectator contributor Matthew Lynn writes on our website this week that regardless of who comes out on top, it will be Ursula von der Leyen, who is the most powerful German politician around. To explain, Matthew joins me now. Now first, Matthew, can you remind us in layman's terms what happened in the German elections for those of us that haven't been following along as closely as you? Uh, well, it was it was kind of a four way draw uh, at the end of the day. I mean, no one got anything close to a commanding majority. The the Social Democrats, which is the German version of the Labour Party, I guess, you know, just about came in, came in front with twenty five percent of the vote. The CDU, Angela Merkel's party, the Conservative Party, you know, the dominant force for the last twenty years or so. A very disappointing result, twenty four percent or so of the vote. The Greens did pretty well, but not as well as they were doing in the polls uh, a few months ago. They did fourteen percent, and and the slightly oddly named Free Democrats. They're sort of, they're not like the Liberal Democrats, they're sort of um, pro, we don't have anything quite like it in this country, they're kind of pro-free market, um, pro-business party. Uh, they scored about 11%, and then there was the, the far-right AFD on about 10%. So it was just a completely, you know, completely inconclusive result. I mean, you know, the SPD came ahead, but by such a whisker, no one was close to, no one was close to a, a real majority, uh, and they're going to have to cobble together some kind of coalition uh, with a chancellor. But whoever that person is, they're just not going to have a huge degree of, of, of public support. So is it right then to say that the most powerful German politician, whoever the next chancellor is, is not going to have a really strong mandate? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. Like, you know, anyone who, you know, if you poll 25% in a general election, you can't come out of it and say you have a tremendous mandate. You know, three quarters of the electorate voted for somebody else and, 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 and weren't looking for you. It's a very, very fragmented, probably, you know, much closer to an Italian system than a traditional German system. And traditionally, Germany, you know, was a big two-party system, um, much like the UK, with sort of, you know, smaller parties, uh, a bit like the Lib Dems in this country, on about sort of 5 to 10% of the vote. 
and that's completely gone. I mean, it's a four, it's a four to six party system, uh, and that tends to be very unstable. I mean, in the past, the past ten years or so, Angela Merkel's held it together, uh, but it'd be a mistake to assume that her successor can do the same. Well, yes, you've slightly preempted me there because I'm wondering what this means for domestic policy and indeed foreign policy. For Germany, is there going to have to be a lot of compromise? Historically, are German parties good at compromising to get some kind of policy over the line or is it going to be a stalemate? I think it'll probably be a stalemate. I mean, you know, the most likely coalition you'll see, you'll see at the moment is, is the Social Democrats and the Greens and the Free Democrats. Um, it, it's hard to see really what, what those three parties have in common, apart from the fact that they're not, they're not the Christian Democrats. You know, you have a kind of traditional, fairly old school, sort of trade union dominated Labour type party. You know, you have a very radical ecological party and a kind of pro-business party. It's going, to be, it's going to be a mess. And I think the interesting thing is it's going to be very unstable. Uh, uh, it's going to be unstable. You couldn't guarantee that the government will survive because it will be three parties. Um, so it's only going to be, you know, one crisis away from somebody thinking, oh, actually, I'm going to pull out of this. I'm going to precipitate an election. So I think you're going to have instability. Um, and secondly, uh, you're not going to have much clarity of, poli uh, of policy. I don't think you're going to see any kind of clear leadership coming out of Germany. I mean, you know, the critics of Angela Merkel's you know, long 16-year reign, she, 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 she kicked the can down the road um, and she postponed any kind of problem and she avoided hard decisions. Um, but, you know, you'll probably look back on that as a kind of goal golden era of German politics of a decisiveness uh, compared to what the next four years are going to be like. Well, very optimistic, Matthew. Uh, you write in your piece for Coffee House this week that the real winner of the German elections is the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Can you explain? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think that flew under the radar a little bit, but uh, you know, a couple of points I'd make there. Um, you know, one, I think actually, you know, von der Leyen's going to emerge as the most powerful German politician. You know, she's going to have this very weak chancellor in Berlin, which is a big contrast to, to you know to, to Merkel, who, uh, whatever her domestic problems, you know, she was a commanding figure. Her successor was not going to be a commanding figure at all for for all the reasons we just discussed. Uh, whereas, you know, von der Leyen, you know, she, she, the EU, it's a funny body. She hasn't, hasn't had a great track record of success so far, uh, particularly on the vaccines, but that's not really relevant. That doesn't really matter in Brussels, uh, whether anything actually works or not. Um, she's, you know, she can be very powerful. She can be very decisive. You know, it's, um, it, you know, the commission has a lot of power. She can get up and launch initiatives and, and spend money and do things that she's going to make, you know, by, she's going to be by far the most powerful uh, German politician. And I certainly wouldn't discount, you know, her, her kind of returning to Berlin in four years to, to save the Christian Democrats and, and bring them back to power. But I think the second thing that's interesting, uh, apart from her personal standing, is just how much power uh, the Commission uh, is accumulating for itself. It's kind of flying under the radar because, you know, they're doing it, they're doing it by stealth. Um, it's a bit like, you know, in this country, Gordon Brown used to in increase taxes in the size of the state a lot, but he, he, he did something quite clever, which he never told anyone about it. Uh, and that kind of helped because he felt if he told anyone about it, um, there might be some opposition. And if you look at what the EU is actually doing, you know, it's having a huge increase in power. It's taking control of health policy. Uh, which, as we know, uh, in, you know uh, in every country in the Western world, when you control health policy, you control pretty much everything, especially in a pandemic. Uh, the Coronavirus Rescue Fund is a huge increase in economic power. Um, it had its own budget, it has its own debt, and it has control of national budgets and spending, and spending powers. And if you look at the rule of law conflicts with Hungary and Poland, it's, it's taking control of constitutions as well. Uh, so that's, you know, probably the biggest increase in powers for the EU Commission since the launch of the single currency, and probably even bigger. Uh, and that, and, you know, and von der Leyen has been good at pushing that forward. And without much opposition in Berlin, you know, Merkel and, and, and was the most powerful local politician, national politician, putting a break on that and saying, no, you know, not too much power, keep power in the national governments. Um, very hard for anyone else to stand up to it. The French are very enthusiastic. Uh, so are the Italians. So all the big, you know, the two other big states uh, will be in favour of increasing that kind of federal uh, overreach and Germany will probably not be in a position to oppose it. Well, Matthew, let me ask, how is the EU trying to centralise healthcare? That strikes me as really quite a big deal. Surely they would have learned their lessons through vaccine procurement, which went so badly 
at the start of the year that that is perhaps not something that Brussels should be doing and should absolutely be devolved to, to smaller states. I mean, to, to what extent are they really trying to bring health care into Brussels? Oh, well, I, you know, I think I think that's clearly the case. Yeah, look, I mean, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're bureaucrats and technocrats. You know, they don't they don't let little things like like success or failure get in the way. Why, you know, why should they? What's that? What's that? What's that got to do with it? Um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's a it's a bureaucratic technocratic organization. And we know from experience that they like to increase their power. Why? You know, why wouldn't they um, like any like any organization? So they took control of vaccine policy. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a great success, but, you know, they kind of got there in the end. Um, and you can argue about, you know, about the decisions that were made, but they're now saying their line is that it was a success and they're, and, and they're keeping control of vaccines and, and they're moving further. If vaccines give them a kind of wedge, I think, to take more and more control of health policy. Matthew, to sum up, it sounds like you're saying that a, a, a weaker Germany, a Germany that can't provide that check on power to the EU, naturally means that Brussels is going to be stronger. But isn't a weak Germany still bad for the EU overall? Absolutely. I mean, it's bad. It's bad for the European economy. I mean, I think that's very true. And I mean, you know, I'm saying it'll it'll increase the power of the, uh, uh, of the Commission in Brussels. And I think that's just an observation. I know you, if we're going to say is that a good thing? Well, no, I don't think it is. Um, because, you know, just coming back to your earlier point, if you look at, look at health policy uh, and many other aspects of policy, it's actually much better to, to control that at a more local uh, national level. Uh, but the reality is that the Commission is increasing its power and, you know, uh, the other countries in Europe are going along. With it. But yeah, absolutely no. I mean, a weak Germany is not good for is not good for Europe, the rest of Europe, and that includes the UK because you know, Germany's you know it's a rich, successful country. It can it can be in modest sort of stagnation uh, for a heck of a long time without anyone really minding. But it you know it has it has it has quite a lot of problems. It's over reliant on the car industry. It's over reliant on exports. Uh, it's absolutely nowhere in the digital industries. You know the extraordinary statistics: forty four percent of German companies still use fax machines. <laughs> Um, you know, most people are like, what, what exactly is a fax machine still? Where do you plug it in? How does it work? Um, it's, it's got a lot of problems which are built up. I mean, the Merkel years have been, uh, you know, described, I think, quite accurately as, you know, years, years of, of stagnation. But that's going to be on roller skates. That's going to really speed up. That's going to become much more the case. You know, I think, um, you know, uh, in retrospect, she's going to look fairly good compared to what comes next. The coalition that's likely to emerge uh, in the next two or three months will be less less decisive uh, and will have less power uh, and certainly won't be interested in any kind of, you know, I, I was about to say radical economic reform, but that would be way over the top. Even modest economic reform, I think, will be, will be off the agenda. I think the National Health Service also uses a disproportionately high number of fax machines. Yeah. And I'll let our watchers <laughs> decide point. what to make of that. Yeah, not, not something you usually want to emulate for, for efficiency and modernity and forward thinking. Well, that's a whole different conversation. Thanks, Matthew. And finally, the new James Bond film hits the cinemas this weekend. It comes in, however, at 2 hours and 43 minutes. Is that too long? Ascenda Max Tone Graham writes in this week's magazine that it's part of a trend of films, plays, and speeches dragging on. She joins me now. Ascenda, thanks for coming on. You write in the magazine this week that films, among many other things, are just too long these days. Why do you think that? Well, I do wonder whether after our lockdown habits of tucking up to one hour long episode every evening of the Netflix drama we're currently addicted to, um, it, whether we can really cope with this two, 163 minute Bond film that I have just now booked for for Sunday afternoon and already slightly dreading a third, of, a third of a day being taken up watching this thing. And just wonder whether those days of the public being able to, happy to surrender themselves in the dark in a communal captive situation are over. So do you think that the snappiness of Netflix and Amazon shows have essentially ruined our attention span? Well, I wonder. I mean, although some people could say that the, the, the 62 episode long Breaking Bad, for example, is actually the most bloated form of art imaginable. In fact, far more bloated than a, than a 163 minute film. Um, but I suppose the great thing about that is you can get up and make a cup of coffee in the middle of it. You can press pause. You can press watch next episode. Um, I wonder if this James Bond film had a watch next episode on the hour every hour. We might be able to, we might be more happy to cope with it. It's just that sort of sprawlingness of it that I'm, I feel rather nervous about for, for, for Sunday. I've got to go at the two o'clock, hoping to be out by my cup of tea at ten past five. But yeah, that's a long time. 
Well, as somebody who adored but also binge Breaking Bad, I, I did watch it with a friend. And so we would pause and talk about it. And maybe that was subconsciously our attention span saying we need to take a small break. But what you're saying is that we, we need that little bit of space in between a, a really long program um, and, and being able to do other things. So it's, it's more about just getting up, getting that cup of coffee, you think, than actually people's desire to have something like a film or a story uh, go on for a really long time. Yes, although I do think I talk about time empathy in, in, the, in the piece. That's what really what it's about. It's about the creator of the art, um, of the work of art, um, think, really imagining himself in the audience's shoes, perhaps an audience who needs to go to the loo. Um, and how, you know, how much longer do they really... Can, could they not cut that bit? Could they not cut that lingering shot, that reaction shot? Could they not just trim it? And sometimes I wonder about the self-indulgence of, of these people who really are so in love with their creation, they cannot, cannot cut it. Well, yes, I was going to ask about that too. Is there an issue of, of self-indulgence here that perhaps uh, this two and a half, three hour film isn't being made for the audience, it's being made for the director? Well, that is, that is a worry. I mean, do you remember being sitting through Gandhi in the 1980s? I mean, and, and, and God's for gone with the wind. I mean, you know, these have been some of the most long afternoons of my, my life. And I, 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 do, I always do think about the sort of self-indulgence aspect of it. Um, and I talk about plays as well. Um, you, you, you really have to... You, you have to keep an audience on your side and, and that people never want, I mean, never want that something to be longer. Never. Well, you, never you, you mentioned Shakespeare in your piece. Does this apply to him too? <laughs> yes, I know that's a bit, a bit naughty really to start taking up, taking Shakespeare on for his Act 4s. But I must say, looking at Antony and Cleopatra Act 4, I mean, I can really do without it. <laughs> um, just no, get off to Act 4. Uh, of, co of course, the flip side of this, so I've, I've booked my Bond ticket for Saturday, I can't wait to go. I see going to the cinema, and, and, and specifically going to the cinema, not just watching a film, as an opportunity to turn off my phone, put it away, and actually have a bit of respite from the rest of the world. So sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, the longer the better. Well, in a way, that's true, um, I, and I, but it is going to be very, very exciting to be in this, in this room. I hope it's going to be full, in spite of the petrol <laughs> crisis, with um, people actually there t together gasping and watching. And that is something we still, still long to do. Um, I'm just hoping that... Um, I'm just certainly not going to have a glass of water before it. Um, and <laughs> try not to have too much popcorn so I don't get too thirsty in the middle. And um, hoping, to goodness, I can make head or tail of it, because sometimes there's such a sprawling mess in these films, I can't even understand what's going on. So you've said you have booked your Bond ticket as well, so you haven't been put off completely by the time. But let me mm. ask you finally, are there any yes. films or plays that you do think warrant that longer running time? The Godfather mm. Part 1, for example, is nearly three hours. Lord of the Rings films, of course, um, were something like three hours long each, um, but really incredible cinema. Yes, you're absolutely right, and there are, there are some that could not be sure. I mean, I was thinking of the tragic mode of Shoah, the, the, the Holocaust movie, which needed to be that, that, that long. Um, and, and some things are... I, I talk about it at the end of the piece, I talk about appropriate length, and I do say I, I, that's the question, appropriate natural length, and things do have a natural length. I mentioned test matches, which are five days long, um, that, that, that just seem right. What I don't like is bloatedness and um, self-indulgent sort of um, taking too long over, over, over shots and over scenes, too much talking, 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 just cut it. Asinda, thanks for coming on. And that's it for this week. If you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel so you never miss out. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week.